There was a little girl dressed in her Sunday best, and she was running as fast as she could. She wanted to get to church on time. She didn't want to miss that opening statement. She didn't want to miss any part of the service, and certainly when the service begins and the church was proclaiming this is what we believe and who we are, and it defines us. Well, she had to get to church on time. So the little girl began to run as fast as she could, and she prayed, Dear Lord, please don't let me be late. Please don't let me be late. Oh, dear Lord. Please don't let me be late. And as she was running and praying and just really claiming, I'm going to be there, I'm going to make it, I'm going to make it. Oh, she tripped and fell and, oh, she dirtied her dress and tore the hem. And oh, she picked herself up and began to brush herself up, began running again and running again. Said, Dear Lord, please, please don't let me be late. But this time, please don't shove me either. <laughs> Today, we're continuing our series as we look at week number four of that defining statement that we opened up with and you so beautifully shared together. That statement that says, this is a place where. And this day, we're focusing on that phrase where we celebrate our diversity, welcoming everyone in unity. How important that is, because we don't want to miss that opening statement where we make this declaration together and saying, this is why we gather. This is the kind of place that we have created. This is our whole purpose. This is who we are and what we do. And we want to begin to celebrate and express this wonderful understanding together. So we say, welcome to City of Light. And what kind of welcome is it? Is it one of those howdy welcomes? Is it one of those delightful to see you? Is it one of those hey? Or is it one of those, uh, you know, greetings and salutations? Or is it shalom, shalom or namaste? Or is it, what's up, bro? Whatever it may be, you know, how we welcome one another is so important. But what we're doing is we're welcoming in a spirit that's founded in today's text that says how good it is, how good it is to dwell together in unity, to come together in that kind of spirit of sense of, understanding of unity together and it's so 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 good when we acknowledge that that's the beginning of what we gather together here to do to be to share to engage in it is so good to dwell together in unity because our belief is this it's founded in that word unity that means that we're all one that word that we have been teaching over and over again that says it talks about a united sense of harmony and oneness together. For here we teach our unity with God, a sense of understanding that we are one with all that is good, one with all that is divine. We begin to teach this that we might awaken to this understanding that there's no separation, but we're one with this. There's a unity then with the Spirit of God within us that's already present. And discovering this wonderful understanding, I'm in unity with the divine that's already within me. And then the next step is that there's truly a unity with one another, a sense of understanding that no matter who we are, where we come from, no matter what our background or what road we're traveling, we're all in this together, and there's a sense of unity in this diverse world. A few years ago, this church was given an award by the Progressive Kingdom Awards, uh, saying that this is the most diverse congregation, most diverse church in the city of Atlanta. It was quite a nice compliment to our congregation as we have celebrated diversity within our ranks, within our body for over 47 years. They wanted to acknowledge this wonderful journey of a spirit that has been so welcoming with uh, all kinds of diversity. In fact, we said we're so welcoming and we celebrate diversity with such great pride that when the Martians land, well, we know where they're coming. They're coming to City of Light. Because they know that anyone who is different or diverse is truly welcome within our body and within our ranks. That's what we believe. This is a place where we celebrate this diversity, where we welcome one another in the power and presence of unity. Now, some people have said, whoa, 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 wait, I visited your church. It's just a little too diverse for me. You know, and that's true in our world today. There are some people who say, I'm not comfortable with diversity. I'm not comfortable with seeing all this kind of uh, expressions of God in divine ways that are so unique and different. What they're really saying is, I haven't really been exposed to the many facets of the one diamond. 
We're all part of this one diamond, and there are many different facets. And as it turns, it sparkles, and it uh, offers a wonderful reflection of light in different and unique ways. So it is here at City of Light. We offer the opportunity for you to see the diamond in all of its beautiful facets, in all of its different ways. Because what we're showing you are the different expressions of God. I have to say, over the years as a pastor, I've been very proud of the diversity that we find within our congregation. We find LGBTQIRSLMNOP. We find all of it welcoming here. We find also the, those straight people. Oh, yes. And we welcome all of those people who may be uh, questioning, wondering, tall, short, black, white, Asian, uh, Hispanic, uh, the many different races, gender identities and gender expressions that are here. And as a pastor, I've always been proud of that diversity. In fact, over my years of ministry, the last 25 years working in more of an inclusive environment, I've always tried to hire diversity as one of the faces of our community. Why? Because I believe in the many expressions of God. And I think the world needs to see the many expressions of God, that God is seen and expressed in unique and different ways. I hired Sarah Eliado, our uh, facility manager, several years ago. Uh, over my years, most of my receptionists and uh, uh, front office people have been transgender in you know, my years of ministry, in the last 25 years working in an inclusive environment. People say, wait a minute, you uh, a transgender person out in front of everybody? I mean, that's the first face of your congregation? Yes. And isn't it beautiful? It's a diverse face of the uniqueness and the wonderful expressions of God. And we're very proud of that. We're proud of all the different expressions. No matter who you may be, I as a pastor, I'm proud of you. We're not singling out any one any better than the other. We celebrate this all in unity. For as the diamond turns, we see the many facets and each one is so gorgeous and so beautiful. How can we say any environment is too diverse for me? Because that would be like saying, wait, I can't, oh, I can't take any more expressions of God. I saw goodness. I saw grace. I can't, don't give me any more. Don't give me any blessings. Don't give me prosperity. Don't give me health and wholeness because that's just too much of a revelation of God for me to handle. I can't take it anymore. You see, this is what we're living in a world that God has expressed in so many beautiful and wonderful ways. And so it is that we welcome one another in this context. Yet it's not a forced diversity not one that is being forced on anybody, but a sense that is birthed out of our understanding of something so powerful and so liberating, and that's the truth of oneness. Oneness. That's a word that sometimes you don't always use. Uh, you know, I mean, onesies, but not onesness. Uh, you know, we struggle with all this. When do I use that word in my language, and what does that mean? Well, what does it mean to be one? What does it mean to be one? It simply is that it's a single unit. It's not two, but it's one. It's just that single entity right there. And being one is like looking at our body. We have one body. We have many different parts. We don't love one part any more than the other. The left hand is not any greater than the right hand. But we appreciate the body, and we really like it when the body works together. We really love it. I like to walk and chew gum at the same time. I feel a little more comfortable knowing that if my body is working together, I got this ability to, you know, kind of make it through in life. And so it is that we understand that this oneness is a sense that though it may be diverse, though it may be unique, have many different parts, it comes together as one single unit and it operates and works well. This oneness then is this universality. It's this completeness. It's being one in this very awakening of this consciousness of God uh, that is so uh, powerful, this infinite intelligence within us. You know, there's that passage of Scripture, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Key word, let. we got to let. Let this mind, the mind that was in Jesus, the mind of Christ, the, the awakening, the enlightenment, the wonderful consciousness of Jesus, let it be in us, for it's available for us just simply to awaken, to say, it's there, it's there, it always has been. Dr. Brenda Bunch shared with us, silent unity is there to awaken what's already there within us. 
so so true it is that this mind that is there, this infinite intelligence, the wisdom of God, it's in you. That's right. It's in you. So we let, we allow, we awaken to this wonderful truth that we walk in this oneness, that the mind of God is the mind of me. And what I'm thinking are the very thoughts of God. And I'm sensing this wonderful oneness that comes together so beautifully. Uh, quite often people have said, you know, I'm thinking this way and God thinks that way. I kind of know that we're kind of in this uh, being torn apart, being pulled in different directions. And it's not like you can walk and chew gum at the same time spiritually. But when you come into this oneness, this alignment together, you're saying, I feel that the infinite wisdom of God within me is my wisdom. And my wisdom that I speak is simply the infinite wisdom of God. And there is no separation. There is oneness. For the mind of God, then not being in conflict with my thinking, my thoughts, not in conflict with me in any way, is simply that statement that says, I'm in oneness with it, full agreement, full welcoming, fully, allow, fully allowing it to be expressed within us. Here's the key, is that there is no separation between us and the divine, yet quite often we have been taught that there is. In our classes this past week here at Emerson Theological Institute, we've been talking about this spirit of separation that is brought forth within our culture today, within Christian tradition, tr Christian traditions. There's a lot of expression of God being feared and separate from man, God holy, man unholy. And the only bridge is somehow through Jesus, as if that were the only way to bring us together. Almost a theological perspective that says, you know, God would be you know, out to eager to punish and to destroy. But Jesus saying, no, 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 don't destroy, don't destroy. I'll make a way for you. I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll cover it for them. And I'll try to bridge the gap of separation between the two. What we miss out, the fact is that there is no separation and never has been. But culture, church traditions have tried to preach this kind of separation as if we need to have some sort of bridge built within us. Yet it's simply a recognition of the Christ consciousness already within us and how important it is. For we see this embodied, that there is a, there's not a separation and there never has been a separation. He thing, never has been, never has been. The story of uh, the prodigal son is so beautiful for it describes the very good news of the New Testament, of the teaching of Jesus. The prodigal son leaving home, taking his inheritance, running off to express himself and to only to find he squanders all of his money and becomes a poor, has nothing, takes a job feeding the pigs, finding food, coming to the lowest of lows of places in society, wanting to return home. The beautiful thing is in the story is that the father never separated from the son. The father never said, good riddance, you're gone. You know what? You try to think about coming back, you're going to have to pay a price. You think about returning home, I ain't waiting on you anytime. The beautiful thing of the story is that the father was watching, waiting, and seeing the son return runs to him. For well, you see, there never was any separation. That separation happens within our lives only when we have forgotten, when we slip away from the consciousness and the awareness of the divine that's already within us. And so it's not like it leaves us nor forsakes us. We just simply forget. And that's one of our great challenges in it. For we know that there is no separation, for we say over and over again, there's not a spot where God is not, right? How many of you remember saying that in different classes and together we proclaim this? There's not a spot where God is not. That's saying that everything is in an aspect of one field of intelligence. Big statement, let's break that down. There's this wonderful thing called the divine, called the universe, called the all good. Wonderful thing, and you're part of it, and you're in it, and it's around you. It's this field of consciousness, awareness, intelligence that we call God, this infinite knowing that we call the divine. You're in it. It's around you. It's in you. It's through you. It's around you, and it's always for you. When we understand this, we draw this circle and we say, this is what it understands to be. I'm in it and I'm one with it. Not separate, but one in this understanding of the divine. So this uh, traditions of 
religions and different pathways of Christianity have tried to teach us a journey of separation, and this is the greatest error in our life. We think we're separate from God. I, you know, I, I always wondered, how is, could someone even embrace the thinking of slavery? How could we put someone, another human, in slavery? It has to come from a concept of such separation. I'm so removed from you. I don't see God in you. I don't see you as a divine creation. I don't see you in that way, so I can treat you in ways that are less than. And we see this carried out in so many aspects within our culture today and in our current events in our world today right now. There's such a feeling of such separation where we're not seeing the God in one another. We're not seeing the oneness. We're not seeing this connection. We're not living in a spirit of unity at all, but a spirit of great separation. And from this one major error, mistake, sin, springs so many other aspects in our journey of our life. When we begin to think that we're somehow removed, somehow separate, it begins to spiral outward for us in our thinking and where we are in our world. But when we understand this, that we are one, we've always been one, and we'll always be one until we forget. That's just it. Our challenge is that we think we're separate and we've forgotten our oneness. So the result of this then, of this forgetting, is that we've created suffering. We think of someone less than. We think of someone separated from us. We think, as an example, if there's a world that we're living in where women are paid less, why? Well, they're not as good as men. We would, that's the cultural thinking. So they're less than, they're not equal to, they're not one with. Do you see how many different examples we could go through in our world today of our society that are coming from this lack of understanding that we are all living in oneness, called to live in unity. For when we realize that we are one, we ask ourselves, who is there to fight against? If I'm one with you and you are one with me, well, then who would we fight with, right? Who would we be at odds with? Who would we bring any harm to? For the ancient teaching says, if you can see God in everyone, you can never do harm to anyone. If I begin to see God, and people all around the world, in different cultures, in the diversity of the world around us. So it is, then there's a difficult time to even think or fathom how there could be any harm that we could do to one another because we realize this wonderful sense of being all one together. This understanding of oneness is based in this. We have to understand that God is good all the time, all the time God is good. Now we say that casually, right? But do you know what that means? All the time, every moment. There's not a moment when God is not good. There's not a second. There's not a minute. There's not a, 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 a microsecond. It's all the time. God is this absolute goodness all the time. And that goodness is everywhere present. And that goodness is in you. For human beings have the spark of this divinity within them, the Christ spirit within the very essence of God is within each and every one of us. The good is in you. The good is in you. The good is in you. Everywhere there's the good. All the time. Now what happens is we forget the good. We forget the God. We forget that and we may act out in ways that society and our world may perceive as not as good. But it doesn't mean that the goodness was removed. That there is not innate goodness in you at all times. And so we call it forth and we're called to bring it forth and to speak it forth and to help awaken to that goodness more and more within each other. That's why we speak the good when we see one another. How beautiful it is to dwell in unity. We come together to lift each other up, don't we? We say, oh, you look great in that outfit. You look fabulous. I see the goodness. I see compassion in you. I see love in you. I've heard about the wonderful blessings in your life and how you've blessed others through that. I see the good in you. And we call it forth. Yet we live in a world too often that says we're sinners. Sinners meaning people who simply made a mistake. It doesn't mean that we're not good or the innate goodness is not there. And so it is then we're called to welcome one another in this goodness. We see it. We understand that there's good in God and God is in us. And we are one in that so that there's good everywhere. There's good in all people around us. And we're called then to look for the good, see the good, speak of the good address the good. 
we've grown up in our world today with that phrase that we love uh, the sinner, but we hate the sin, but we love the sinner. And the problem is, too often what we find is that people will say that phrase and they make the sinner to be the one who is the sin. Not seeing the good in them, but what they do is what we call they personalize it. Well, we see bad in you, so you are bad, and all you are is the bad. And so if you're bad, your family's bad, and your race is bad, your culture is bad, your sexual orientation is bad, your this is bad, your that is bad, and before we know where we go, and we've lost sight of the good. We've just now personalized it, and we're called to impersonalize all those things around us that the world may call as mistakes. For within each and every one is the goodness of God. And as we see it, as we draw it out, as we speak it, as we pull it out, we become those who fan the flames of that divine spark of God within each and every one and allow it to flourish in greater levels than ever before. For when we practice this, what we're doing is we're practicing the very prayer that Jesus prayed. If you look through John, this beautiful passage in the New Testament of John chapters 15 through 17, you find the unfolding of Jesus' great prayer. People say, what, is that the Lord's prayer? Is that the great prayer? Oh, the beautiful prayer that sums up all of Jesus' ministry is the prayer that we might awaken to our oneness, to our unity, to our sense of being one in God. That beautiful prayer is the prayer that he prayed. He said, my prayer is not for them alone, as he prayed to God, I pray also for those who believe in me and through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you and I are one. And you are in me and I am in you, that they may become completely, ooh, I love that, completely one. Not just slightly one, not one on Sundays, not one when it's convenient to be one, but one at all times, for the good of God is good all the time. And we are then awakened to this oneness that is ever going, ongoing, and we awaken to it completely. For Jesus' prayer was that we might awaken to this wonderful understanding that, oh, wow, you, me, we're one. God, the wonderful spirit of the divine, I'm one. And when I say I am I voice the very name of the divine, and I speak it, and it becomes my name. I am God within me. I am, and I speak that name. I call it forth for Jesus' desire in his ministry, what he taught the disciples and what he preached on the mountainsides and what he demonstrated on the waters crossing the Sea of Galilee and how he fed the 5,000 is all this wonderful prayer that somehow you might see that you're one with the divine. No separation. That the good of God is in you, never leaving you, never forsaking you. You may have forgotten, but today's the day to remember once again and awaken to this complete sense, I'm one. I'm one with God. God, one with me. I'm one with one another. I'm one with this world. I'm one with all the people around me. When we dwell in unity, then we are living out this prayer of Jesus. We're bringing life to it as he prayed that we might understand this and then we live it out. So what you find is this is a place.